I'm pleased to be joined by the Commissioner of the New York State Division of Housing and Community Renewal, Judith Calagero. Welcome to Citywide. Thank you, Ken. It's great to be here. So why is it so hard to find a place to live in New York? Well, I know some people certainly struggle with it, but there have been a lot of very positive things going on in New York in the area of affordable housing. I think if you read the same articles in the paper that I read, the last year are some 20,000 new units of housing uh, residential housing in, in New York was uh, built or preserved last year and we had a piece of that through the various different programs that we have at the state level as well as our partnership with the city and the Housing Preservation and Development Office we're doing quite a bit and so there certainly are issues land the cost of land is one of them um, uh, the cost of construction is certainly another issue but there's an awful lot going on that's, all, that's very positive as you know, well. Will Rogers said uh, buy land because they're not making any more of it, but you're, you have a Brownfields initiative which is actually going to prove him wrong. You, you're going to cry and create some new land for development. Tell us about that. It's actually, I think, the new frontier for New York. We have in New York City, I think there's some 4,000 acres of in, uh, industrial sites that were previously used for that purpose that are no longer being used. Right, the jobs have gone, the land is there, and the there's land some, is there. something in the basement that nobody knows what it is. And that's our new frontier. So let's, let's take that land, let's explore uh, what its condition is, and through the new Brownfields program, we're going to have resources uh, to help deal with those issues. Now, we've already been doing this. This isn't something new. Uh, you take the Schaefer site um, through our partnership with the City of New York, the Schaefer Brewery site on the Brooklyn waterfront, I think just north of uh, the Williamsburg Bridge, uh, there's a new, a new housing development going on where they used to make beer. And if you go into Brooklyn a little bit deeper, you'll see the old Rheingold site where they also used to make beer is a project that's even much further along which is absolutely beautiful. I'm going to be out there in two weeks to get an update of where we are on that project, but affordable housing being built now where beer used to be made. And those were brownfield sites. There were soil contaminations. Uh, some soils needed to be removed. Uh, there, uh, remediation took place, and we're able to reuse that property in both of those, uh, those areas, um, in Williamsburg and also in Bushwick, for affordable housing. What, what role does the state play in that? Do you, do you provide money for that or, or how do you get involved? Well, we're financing um, both of those projects. Uh, the Schaefer Development Project is a little bit different than the Rheingold Project. Schaefer has a, a market rate component as well as an affordable housing component. The affordable housing component is primarily using uh, tax credits to finance that project. How, how does that work? That just tell us what a tax credit is. It's a dollar for dollar uh, credit uh, against your federal income tax. And an investor or a corporation looking to invest maybe in affordable housing, and uh, Fannie Mae is one of the largest investors, a lot of the lending institutes institutions in New York, J.P. Morgan Chase, um, uh, Citibank, uh, uh, Fleet, Bank of America, any number one of these institutions are investing in these tax credit programs and they get a credit against their corporate uh, income. Their, and then the developer and, gets the money and, and uses it in the project. Exactly. Um, and it's, it's not as complex as the people in housing like to make it sound. It's a way of getting the private sector to invest in affordable housing, which is good for New York. Is, is that an appropriate role for the government to be playing, or, or should we just let you know, the market decide whether housing gets built or not? I think it's an appropriate uh, uh, program for the government to be involved in. It's very different from government's previous approach to affordable housing, which was to build public housing. And I think you can look around and see uh, the remnants of that in most of our communities in the state and in this country. If you got to Chicago, they're tearing that down. We're doing some of that also in New York, not as much in New York City, but you can go to Mount Vernon and you can see what we've done with public housing there, which has been a tremendous turnaround. 
uh, we've done the same thing in Buffalo. We just recently finished a project in, in Albany in the state capitol where we did the same type of thing with turning around public housing, getting rid of what would, was built 40, 50 years ago, high-rise family housing in our urban centers with no places for our children to play. You replace that with low-rise, more appropriate housing with a lot of green space and uh, you've got something that's the quality of life for the people living there is just uh, so much greater than what we used to have. But we've changed our thinking. We don't want that type of investment in government resource anymore. And so we've replaced that with a tax credit, with loans like the New York State Housing Trust Fund. Uh, this year, the governor's proposed $29 million for the Housing Trust Fund program. Uh, you know, thousands of units of housing will be built or preserved because of that program and the flexibility of that program, our ability to use that in combination with other resources such as the tax credit or maybe something that HPD might have here in the city. It, it seems to me that no matter how much money somebody has, they seem to have trouble finding a place to live. So if you're um, a stockbroker, you're looking at a million dollar price and uh, minimum price for an apartment in Manhattan. If you're uh, uh, a working person, uh, a bus driver, for example, uh, obviously that's out of reach. But so might any kind of of, uh, of home ownership. Uh, is is home ownership in and of itself a, an important goal for for government? And are, are there other techniques that we should be using to encourage that? I, th I think home ownership is a goal of the individual and the role of government is to try to help support that if we can. And it's right for many but it's not correct for all and that's why I think you'll always have mm. some rental programs as well as home ownership initiatives. And in a city like New York where cooperatives and condominium ownership are um, appealing to individuals here, um, that provides us with an option to do that and that can be very affordable and there's opportunities to do that. Our Mitchell Lama portfolio is just one of those options. Let, you, let's talk about that for a second because 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 I think that's where, where a couple of things that we've been talking about sort of came together. So you go back 30, 40 years and the government said to developers, we'll give you a break on your taxes if you agree to, to cap your profits on this uh, for a period of time that period of time is is up. Uh, the developers now say, okay, we want to put these on the open market, and you've got people who've been living in them for 30, 40 years saying, we can't afford to move. But what's going to happen? Well, our approach is to provide incentives to those owners to stay in the program. And, one of the, and we have to have multiple approaches. Uh, these are different developments. They, they came online in different times, and each one of these situations is different. So we'll look at it and come up with some different approaches, and hopefully they will, we'll be able to entice some of them to stay in the program. One such approach is to change the law. Last year, Governor Pataki signed legislation that we had proposed, our agency had actually proposed, to uh, enable local governments to extend the property tax abatement period for those projects once they reach that period of time that they could leave the program. And that's a popular approach because property tax abatement is certainly an expense and depending on the location of the Mitchell Lama, that may be a su sufficient inducement for them to stay in the program. But what that means is, is that we all then wind up subsidizing the people who, who get to stay in those apartments, right? Well, and they get to stay in those apartments, and they're a part of the fabric of the city. They work here, and they live here, and they spend their money here. And you're right, they may be lost to the city. They may no longer be able to, do, to afford to live here if we didn't make those accommodations. We're not just doing it for Mitchell Lama owners. We're doing it in other aspects of our housing programs. There's a 421A tax abatement. There's a J51 tax abatement, and I don't want to get into too many of the technical details, but this goes on all across this country, not just in New York City. It's the one of the vehicles that we use to make certain that there is affordable housing in our communities. And one of the things I think that as a, as a, uh, a community we've decided to do is, to, is, is particularly to try and make housing affordable for seniors, people on, on fixed incomes. You, you do a lot of work in that area. Certainly. Uh, some of our resources are used to actually build or to finance uh, affordable housing for seniors 
and on occasion we're able to hook that up with some services, although some of the laws prevent us from going as far as maybe we'd like to go. Um, but seniors uh, do have uh, some special needs. Um, you have some seniors that have some disabilities that they're, that they're living with, and the longer they can remain independent, and if, if you can make an apartment in a, in a building that helps to meet those special needs, and they can remain in, in such a facility, uh, an apartment, longer um, and live independently, the seniors are happy about that, and they get to remain in, in the community. That and we're not paying for them to be in a nursing home someplace. Yes. Now, I understand you've been involved recently in a, in a, in a very exciting senior project, uh, a very unusual for folks who are not only getting on in years, but also are raising uh, the next generation. Tell, tell us about that, the grandparents the building. The PSS grandparents project in, in the Bronx, um, uh, there are, we understand there's over 100,000 grandparents in the city of New York that are raising their grandchildren. Say that again? Over 100,000 grandparents in the city of New York raising their grandchildren. Now, they weren't expecting to do this in their golden years. Uh, I'm, I'm certain that it's come to a surprise to them as much as it is a surprise to us, but the facts speak for themselves. And when seniors live in senior housing that is really exclusively for them, it doesn't leave room for them to bring their grandchildren to come there to live with them. And so this project will be the first of its kind in New York, a test case, if you will, and we're building housing where grandparents can live there and they can have their grandchildren with them. And they're going to be living next door to a family who will be in the same situation. Citywide will continue right after this. There is really only one boy, one girl, one tree, one forest, one ocean, one mountain, one sky, and one simple way to care for it all. Please visit earthshare.org and learn how the world's leading environmental groups are working together under one name, Earthshare. One environment, one simple way to care for it. Welcome back to Citywide. We're speaking with Judith Calagero, the Commissioner of the New York State Division of Housing and Community Renewal. We were talking about the Mitchell Lama program, and it is uh, an interesting uh, concept of trying to have home ownership for uh, working class and, and, and middle income uh, people. Um, how does the government make home ownership a reality for, for folks who um, don't necessarily, you know, buy a tract house in the suburbs. They, they want to stay in the city or they need to stay in the city or they have to stay in the city, but they want to they wanna own a piece of, of, of the pie. One of, the, one of the more creative projects that I've had the opportunity to work on in the last couple of years is in a Mitchell Lama where we're hoping to create home ownership and we're on the track of doing that. It's a Mitchell Lama development called Cathedral Parkway. It's in Manhattan. I think it's 309 units of of housing and the tenants there for many years have wanted to own their units and we're helping them to achieve that. Um, what we did was brought a developer in who purchased with the Tenants Association the Mitchell Lama development from the previous owners. The project was in need of repair, about six to seven million dollars, primarily in a new facade which is going on right now. The development was purchased, the debt was refinanced, the Tenants Association is there as a partner with uh, Robert Nelson and once the rehabilitation of the building is complete we're working on a plan so that the tenants will buy out Mr. Nelson and will become the owners of their units and take control of the project. Now that's the same model that uh, was behind Co-op City. That's and, correct. And now. Is Co-op City a success or a failure? Well, Co-op City and Cathedral Parkway are two different things. 309 units on Cathedral Parkway side and 15,300 units at Co-op City. You know, a huge, vast difference. Co-op City really is a city, and you have to look at it in that respect. In fact, later this year, Co-op City will be refinanced, and it will also stay in the Mitchell Lama program as Cathedral Parkway will. Uh, co-op city is already a limited equity co-op 
and those individuals own their units, which will be the same situation, the ownership structure at Cathedral Parkway. Uh, Co-op City, though, has many other um, uh, items that put a stress and strain on them. They have their own, uh, their own electrical plant. They, create, they have the, the ability to create their own power and their own electricity. They have their own school there, and there are many commercial places as well. Uh, streets, uh, a, a lot of infrastructure, and certainly the garages have been an issue. Um, but things are really looking up at Co-op City. Later this year, with the refinancing, over $250 million will be invested back into Co-op City to make a lot of those necessary repairs. I think that the people who live at Co-op City and who call that home, as well as all of its neighbors, will see some major changes that will be for the positive. Despite the fact that 20,000 units in construction or, or uh, new units uh, rehabilitated, um, there has been a sense for a long time that the rent regulation system in New York has discouraged people from developing, that people uh, would rather put their money someplace else rather than caught, get caught up with the, uh, with the bureaucracy. Uh, and it has made uh, landlord-tenant relations in New York uh, somewhat of a blood sport. You administer the system. What, what's your take on it? Is, is rent regulation uh, working for New York? Well, right now, I think the legislature has made the decision that it's a non-issue, at least for the next eight years. They kind of removed it from our plate. They made a decision that the, the program and policies that we have in place are working, and they're good enough to get us through the next eight years. Um, you know, certainly we have a lot of complaints from landlords as well as from tenants, and I always kind of felt that if we could stay somewhere in the middle, um, then we're probably doing our job. I will tell you that one of the things that government wasn't doing well before and is doing well now is our case backlog. Not giving people decisions. They come to the state to help them work out their problems. And for us to not make a decision and to not help resolve those difficulties right. is not what's best for New Yorkers. How many cases in a typical year and how bad was the backlog when you, when you got the job? 79,000 cases was a the year. backlog. That was a, that was a backlog, yes. okay? We just went below 5,000 cases wow. last month. Wow. Wow. And how many new cases would you get in a typical year? Oh boy, uh, I don't know. That's right. I, I would have to check. But it's a lot, say. right? It certainly this is. This is uh, somebody says the 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 uh, when I moved in I had a garage. Now they took the garage away, or my rent is too high, or, or whatever. Or the landlord coming and saying I just fixed up the bathroom. Let me Correct. raise the rent. But another positive thing that we're doing is running a mediation program because sometimes you can resolve those problems by getting the parties to sit down and work them out and sometimes you can't and you end up maybe working through the courts. But in the situations where we can resolve problems, we can keep our case backlog even lower by helping to mediate in those situations and re resolve those problems before they do get to that point, as you say, that point where there's no return between the landlord and the tenant. What is a typical day like for you? Oh boy, um, I, I travel a lot around the state. It's important for me as a commissioner to be in as many of these communities as possible. And we have issues all over the state. We also have offices in Buffalo, Syracuse, Albany, and New York. We have offices in each borough in New York, primarily in Manhattan and in Queens. And it's important for me with a staff of 950 people that I'm accessible to them. So. I'm in the car, in between our offices, and visiting our projects, and meeting with the heads of the municipalities and our towns and villages all the time. And how did you wind up as a commissioner? Well, I served as a deputy commissioner beforehand. Yeah, well, for, that's not a real answer. So that's, <laughs> how did I have? Well, um, you know, my dad served in, in the government, and my mom was also a public servant for a time, and I guess they left me with a sense of responsibility that government service is, is good and I just developed that type, type of an interest is I guess but had you worked kid. in the housing field before you went to work for the site 25 years housing finance started out in the nonprofit sector and worked my uh, way through to working with an advocacy organization that advocated for affordable housing I, I'm only going to ask you one other personal question which is do you own or do you rent 
I own. <laughs> and I'm in rehab right now. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> My bathroom had to be gutted. It's interesting. It, it, it gives you a different perspective on what, uh, what property owners go through, I'm, uh, I'm sure. It does. The, the, the poor people don't have options. Uh, and there's a new initiative from the federal government, I guess it was adopted many years ago, but to require tenants in public housing to perform um, uh, some level of community service. We don't, um, imp well, Congress hasn't imposed that obligation on um, other kinds of residents. Uh, if you get a, a Section 8 voucher or if you live in, in, a, in, a, in a subsidized unit that's been financed with tax credits, do people who live in public housing, um, do they need that kind of attention? I'm sort of asking you to put on your community renewal hat for a mm -hmm. second, your, your advocacy hat for a second. Is it, where, where, what's, our, what's our attitude towards people who need help to, to pay the rent? Is it, is, it be, is it something that society needs to just do because they need shelter, or is it something where we have to help them get out of that? Um, and is housing the right incentive to do that? Well, some people are in that situation not just because of their financial situation, but it could be because of their health. And they may have situation in their life that prevents them from doing that type of service. But for those individuals that are able to, to serve in that capacity, it, there certainly are opportunities for all of us to learn a little bit more about our communities and what's going on in them by doing that type of service. And so for some, they've seen it as a positive and through that type of work, also opportunity maybe for some type of job growth. Are there programs that other jurisdictions are doing around the country that, that you'd like to try in New York? We're, we participate uh, with the National Council of State Housing Agencies, and we're very active in that organization. And through that, we get to learn about what all of the other states are doing. And we certainly, if we can borrow from them and not reinvent, we certainly are doing that whenever we can. And they do the same with us as well. We have a program called the Homes for Working Families program. It's a bond initiative. And uh, some of the other states have emulated that. So there's a sharing of information at that federal level. My thanks to Commissioner Judith Calagero of the New York State Division of Housing and Community Renewal. That's all for this edition of Citywide. I'm Ken Fisher. Thank you for joining us.